Om Mani Padme Ham. The soul of Detroit strikes for justice. It is truly written that the man with no future is dangerous. There were 100 such men in the Red Shovel Network, all of them with microphones. From the mystery of the Far East, from the mountain peaks of a Shangri-La, come the exciting adventures of M.L. Elric, the wealthy young American who, after 10 years in Tibet, returned as the, the soul of Detroit to carry on a single-handed fight against injustice and crime. You ass in a rag and the trash is out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? That is not paid for by them. That is paid for by the people of Detroit. You might be qualified, ML. I'm not qualified for this job. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Al? Hey kids, it's your old pal M.L. Elric, and our first guest needs no introduction, so I'm going to introduce him in just a minute. <laughs> Let me introduce you to a couple of scrubs that you probably have never heard of before, but if you have heard of them before, I don't know why you came back. That would be uh, that'd be Mark Fellhauer who just took the needle off the record. I don't know what happened there. That does not bode well. Wow, what a happy accident. Well, we're going to let the beat go on. <laughs> Happy accident. And uh, and Mr. Sunshine over there is is Sean Windsor, who uh, who is uh, is here to uh, bring us a little bit of of, of uh, frankincense, myrrh, and um, and some gold. Right? Let me just say that I um, I'm in love with the new line. It's maybe not a new jawline, but what you've done there with your beard, I can see it. I can see the demarcation between whiskers and flesh. I'm impressed. You look uh, more handsome than ever. Are, are you setting up our Manscaped uh, dot com promotion early? Is That's that how you want to take it. <laughs> I'm just trying to say how sexy you look today. Wow. Okay. Hey man. I see. Yeah, it we is need the to, season. It is. We need to change the we water. A, <laughs> we need a little more mistletoe in, in the here. tank. <laughs> well, uh, Matt Matt uh, Jennings will be joining us shortly with a uh, fake history lesson, um, which uh, we did some we did some last minute cramming. And I will tell you that uh, he is primed for his midterm, so stick around for that. And Joe Zuver is is like uh, is like the invisible hand that keeps the economy moving. You don't see him, you don't smell him, you don't hear him, but but he's there, and he's the one who uh, who makes it all successful uh, on other Mark? shows, not on this show. But he that's, mentioned me. that's not his fault. So we started with Mark. Thanks for paying attention. Oh, but I mean, I thought Mark was the invisible hand. No, no, Mark. I'm the loud hand. No, we can see Mark's hands. We just unfortunately, I can't. They just seem to be pumping furiously. (laughs) Um, And uh, and our special guest is uh, my predecessor as investigative reporter at at Fox Two, a legend in this town. uh, Some of the sweetest pipes around. And if you need somebody to find out where the dirt got done, he's still doing that with his own private investigations firm. That would be the one, the only Scott Lewis. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, ML. And uh, a bit later, we're going to be joined by Dear Nichols, contributing columnist at the Detroit Free Press, and John Rutherford, the co-owner of the Cadu Cafe, to talk about what's being done and what we can do to help support our entertainment venues and our bars and restaurants, because this lockdown is going to continue. And I should tell you, I, I, uh, my, my weekly skate was supposed to resume this week, and the rink said, whatever the governor decides, if you want to skate, we'll let you in the side door. And I said, you know what? We ain't going to do that because uh, we've been we've been drilling people who have been been uh, thinking they're better or the rules don't apply, uh, and we're not going to be those people. So uh, so thanks, but no thanks, no no workout this week. But I do want to before we get going, let you know who makes it possible for us to be here, and that would be uh, Mark. Any guesses? Uh, well, there's lots of people. I'm going to go with Royal Brian Ford to start. You know, that is a, is good, a good place guess? to go for a new ride, for service repairs, or even just a top-notch oil change. My mom bought a red Ford Focus wagon there, uh, still rolling strong. She's not alone. Royal Brian has been taking care of customers for nearly 75 years from the corner of Nine Mile and Mac. And if you don't feel like taking that that right track to Nine Mile Mac in St. Yeah. Clair Shores... Go to RoyO'Brien.com and check out Fast Track, which lets you choose your vehicle and options. 
But that's not all. You can pick your deal, lease, finance, or cash, get the value of your trade-in, apply for financing, and schedule service of your ride. If you go in person, they're doing everything they can to make it safe for you and their employees. So I've been there myself, just got some new tires put on after the show a week or so ago. Rolling strong, got a great deal, getting 70 bucks back. So that's that's not bad this time of year. And they have all kinds of uh, deals for you to get your ride serviced, to get it spiffed up, or maybe you just want a new one. I think they're going to have the Bronco soon. So check it out. They have a great showroom, great staff. To learn more, visit royalbryan.com. That's R-O-Y-O-B-R-I-E-N.com or call 888-566-5851. When you go there, or when you click on their link on our website, make sure that they know that ML sent you. So thanks, O'Brien. Beautiful. Yes, it's great. Well done. So Scott, um, you know, my first day at, at Fox 2, I got your old desk. Here we go. Oh, and, uh, that did not take long. And I, I, I pulled the drawer open, and there was a decoder pen in the drawer. <laughs> And, no kidding. and I just was wondering what, what were you using that for? I mean, what, what I, I hadn't seen that before, but it did come in very, it did come in very handy. Cause I used it many times to try and figure out what the hell Rob Walchek was talking about. <laughs> you for sure need it for him. I can oh tell you God. that. Was there still gum stuck under the desk or no? Uh, not only was there gum stuck under the desk, but still a lot of flavor. <laughs> oh God. That just ABC tells me, gum, huh? <laughs> that just tells me you had a better contract than I did. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. But um, no, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, stepped in to fill the shoes because, um, you know, investigative reporting in Detroit is important. You did a great job. Glad to see you back on the free press, too. So oh, um, thanks. Hard times for the media right now, though, isn't it? Uh, it is. I mean, it, Sean is having a slum here with the podcasters. So that tells you something right there. And I, I think this is my main job. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> this and this in the paper route. Yeah. Damn. And I. I <laughs> I'm not too optimistic about that. But that's okay. Route. I get divinity uh, around this time of the year on the paper route, you know. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Passed out to me in lieu of uh, payments. But, to the, but to but that we, point, we are looking at some some possible layoffs, I think, at the newspaper. So we certainly oh, encourage people to subscribe to support the journalism and to support the kind of journalism that, that Scott, you became known for. I think if you were – if you were a cop who wasn't uh, doing his job, if you happened to be one of those water department workers uh, having a nod in one of those blue vans, the last thing you wanted to hear was, hi, I'm Scott Lewis, because uh, that was that was the beginning of a really, really bad day. Yeah, if I show up in your rear view mirror, it's going to be a bad day back in the day. Um, yeah, I remember the busted on the job uh, classics. That was probably my favorite time in TV when I was getting all these guys screwing off on the job. And it allowed me to have a little bit of fun with the story because the behavior was so outrageous. You know, I'd play the crazy songs and everything. Mitch Album ripped on me about it, but everybody what? else in Detroit loved it. And it really put Fox 2 on the map. Um, I had to tell you a funny story. I met my wife, Nancy. My first wife passed away many years ago. And I met my wife, uh, Nancy. She sat down next to me at the bar at Lucy's in Gross Point. And I had makeup on. I just came from work. And she said, what the hell are you doing wearing makeup? This is how we met. And I told her I was on TV and she said, well, I don't watch TV and didn't have a clue who I was. A couple minutes later, she starts reciting all these details from a bunch of my stories. And I said, I thought you didn't watch TV. And she said, I don't. I said, well, how do you know all that? She said, Drew and Mike. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that's hilarious. I, I was always on Drew and Mike. It was a fa favorite way to start the day. Well, we haven't seen you in so long. Do you miss being on TV? Do you miss being seen and doing those stories? I can honestly say that I haven't had a day since I left in 2013 where I got up and said, gee, I wish I was back in TV today. You know, I had a terrific run. I did, gee, I started radio at uh, 16 years old. I did nine years in radio in what, Detroit. What, what radio did you do? Um, I came to Detroit. I w uh, was at a small station in northern Wisconsin when I started in high school, then um, worked uh, commercial radio all through college, then went to Milwaukee, then Got a job at WWJ in Detroit when they went all news, mm -hmm. then got hired away to WXYZ when they switched to news talk. Then I lost my job with my wife, um, uh, seven months pregnant, which was oh. really a good incentive to find work. And the only two jobs open in, in Detroit were at Channel 2, and I got one of the jobs at Channel 2. I was there for 22 years, and then uh, the economy crashed, so I took an early retirement did like the cops do, took the, the pension, and then got a second job at Channel 7 for um, 
three years. And I just felt um, at that point, um, I'd done most of what I wanted to do, and I didn't think that there was uh, much more to do. And I realized I was more in love with investigating than I was in love with TV. So I um, went out and got my PI license and uh, gave them a good long notice that I was going to leave and started my own company. Scott, I think I've told you this story about uh, one of my last days at Channel 4 where we were out trying to get somebody who I think was kind of, there was a question of whether or not the bus stop for the school was too close to the home of a sex offender. And Mm -hmm. so we went out there and those buses start way earlier than I like to start. And we were out there waiting for the bus to come by and we ultimately determined we didn't think it was that bad, but we had to meet with the source afterward. And it was so early, we thought, well, we don't want to go knock on the source's door at six in the morning. So we'll come back around eight or nine. And so we pulled off not too far from where we had been doing our surveillance into a parking lot. And I decided to have a nap. But the minute I closed my eyes, I thought, if that son of a bitch, Scott Lewis, comes and knocks on the glass and catches me <laughs> napping, this will be my last day <laughs> at Shell 4. So th- you you interrupted a lot of naps, my friend. <laughs> well, I have to say, I might be the only reporter in television who ever busted my coworkers. Fanchon <laughs> Stinger, for oh. one. Um, oh, I'm not man. invited to her Christmas parties. Um, you remember she was involved with Rayford Jackson. Yep. I broke that story when I was at Fox 2 and... Um, the other person um, was, um, he was our IT guy, and I got a tip that he was a convicted embezzler and um, found out he had stolen a million dollars from a company, and um, they started looking, he had a warrant out for his arrest, and they started looking at the books at Channel 2. They realized that he had stolen money from Fox 2. He was writing fake invoices for supplies for IT stuff and having it sent to his home. And so I was pleading with the boss to let me bust them in the hallway. (laughs) And they said, I won't let you do that, but um, we'll call them in for a fake IT problem. And you can be at the gate guard with the Southfield police and and jump him while he's getting arrested. So what happened is it leaked out to him that I was on to his game and he sent in an email and resigned. So I ended up having to catch up with him at his arraignment at the uh, Warren Police Department once he got arrested. There might have been one other co-worker I, I did, too. I'm sure uh, Fox 2, with all the money you saved them by busting that guy, gave you a nice little bonus for that one, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think they ever got their money back, but uh, it was crazy. Wait, who, this guy claimed to be a Detroit police sergeant, and he would leave this police jacket on his chair in the office, and he was never there. Where, where the hell is this guy? Every time something broke, you couldn't find him. And uh, then I found out he was never a police officer. He was a um, he was a reservist. And he had also been accused of stealing money from a political campaign. So the guy was a real piece of work. Um, but, um, yeah, those were the days when, uh, doing all the ambush interviews. But I have to say, I, if I had, um, someone who wasn't a moving target, and I know you're the same way, ML, if, if it's a, you know, a politician or someone, you always give them a chance to sit down and tell them truthfully, this is what I've got. This is what I want to talk to you about. But a lot of these people, if they knew that I was looking for them, they'd be in Bermuda or, Venezuela or something, I never find them. So um, sometimes you have to use that that ambush interview. It's the only time to get them. And you just hope they talk because they don't know that when I would walk up, I knew the answer to every question I was <laughs> asking before I asked it. So you just pray they answer the questions and try to lie to you. It makes great TV. Scott, was one of the other uh, former co-workers you busted, Charles Pugh? Uh, no, I wasn't. I um I did do quite a bit of investigating on Charles Pugh and I was this close. And that's a really good question now that I think about it, because one of my regrets in television is that I never got the Charles Pugh story on. I had one, one link I was missing one little link. And I could have, I could have exposed that he was doing inappropriate things with kids. Um, And I was staying on the conservative side. And then, after he got exposed, I was I was working with Ross Jones, who mm-hmm. really did expose Charles Pugh, and I helped him with the story. But as I thought back on it, I thought there might have been a, another way where I could have gotten that story on TV. I might have not got, gotten the whole banana, but as you guys know, you can sometimes start with a piece of a story if it's good and then build on it. So, yeah, Charles Pugh, I, I, I didn't do. And I, I remember when he told me he was going to run for city council, I called him aside and I said, Charles, do the right thing, man. Detroit 
doesn't need any more corruption. Please go in there and be clean and work for the people. He wasn't in there for a couple of months. I started getting phone calls. You know, he had the funds set up like Kwame. And so I went to interview him about this slush fund he had. And um, as we're walking out, he said, oh, it wasn't really a birthday party. As we're walking out, he's got this massive birthday card in his office as we're walking by with the cameras and we're taking um, we're taking pictures of it. So after Charles went to city council, I did do some investigative work on him. But I'm really disappointed because I thought Charles um, was a very bright and nice guy. Yeah. He was actually one of my favorite guys at Fox, too. A lot of fun. But um, he just went down the wrong path. Yeah, he. Uh, you mentioned the whole banana. That was his problem. He wanted the whole banana, but <laughs> but I, I, I will say I, I was I was contacted um, by a law enforcement at some point when I was at Fox Two that was inquiring about something related to uh, Charles Pugh. And the one thing that they told me that made me feel better um, is that. Uh, when they were asking what I knew and, and they were asking what I knew about him from his time in city hall. And, um, and I said, well, what, how did, how did Fox two handle him? And they said that based on their investigation, they thought that Fox two had, had given him, uh, was unaware of some of his, his inappropriate conduct. And when they were aware of things that they had handled it well, which I, I was glad to hear because you don't want to know, that uh, we, we see so often that, that predators are enabled by bosses who say this guy means so much to the operation, we're going to let him run wild, that whatever inappropriate activity Charles was doing that crossed the line, Fox either wasn't aware of it or said, hey, knock that shit off. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know. I, yeah, I think these TV stations enabled a lot of people. I mean, look at Bill Bonds. Um, remember when he was so hammered at, and I love Billy, he was mm -hmm. a great guy, but he was so hammered at five o'clock in the morning, he was lost, didn't know where he was. And then he pulled into a gas station. He's given himself the thumbs up in his rear view mirror. Um, you know, he did some pretty outrageous things and they, you know, they kept him on for years. So I do think that sometimes these media outlets put, um, money ahead of, uh, moral, morals and ethics. Look at the network guys, you know, the yeah. sex scandals and, at Fox and, and the other networks, um, these people knew this stuff was going on. Well, they they certainly did with Bill O'Reilly because they were writing the checks. You know, I mean, yeah. it was it was O'Reilly's uh, victims who were getting checks from Fox that said, "Let's not talk about this." Mm -hmm. So it's it's really disturbing when you got you've got people that are supposed to be looking out for the, to do the right thing, and um, they're people that need to be investigated. They're doing all the wrong things. So. Um, I don't think it's it's like, you know, dirty cops. We've got dirty cops out there. We've got people in the media that are bad. But I think by and large, um, most reporters um, try to do the right thing and they're honest, good people. Um, and, you know, we need them. <laughs> we need them more than ever now, I think. Now, so now you're private investigator, scottlewispi.com, if anybody wants to hire him. And I actually do remember the last place I saw he was recently on Netflix and Unsolved Mysteries. You're working the uh, Joanne Romaine Matuk or Matuk Romaine? I can never, never remember. Matuk Romaine. Matuk, Matuk Romaine. Romaine. That story um, on the east side, was it Was it a suicide? Was it an accident? Was it a murder? How long have you been working that case? Um, I picked that case up right after I became a PI in 2013. And um, I met with Michelle, the daughter, and I told her, look, I've had a lot of experience with suicide in my, my TV and radio days. And there's a great amount of denial in families because it's hard to accept that someone you really love took their life. So um, I'm going to look at this case if you want me to review it, and then I'm going to give you an honest answer. If I think there's any chance that this was a suicide, I'm out. If I think it was a murder, then I'll help you. I'll do whatever I can to help investigate it, and I'll do whatever I can to help um, raise awareness and get publicity. I think I did as much of that as I did uh, investigating. And I, when I looked over this case, I just said, there is no way in hell that that woman walked into two feet of water in January out in front of the church and was zero current and drowned herself and was found 27 miles down river on the Canadian side of Bablo Island. And her body and her clothing are completely intact. There weren't even scrapes on her boots or anything. her boots were still on. So there was so much about this that just didn't add up. The timeline was way off. Everything about this case smells and it, it, it just reeks foul play to me. 
and um, why the police decided in five minutes that they had some footprints in the snow by the edge of the water and a butt mark and a car parked in the driveway that this was a suicide. And they call out all the king's you know, men with helicopters and divers and something for a suspiciously parked car and some footprints. I mean, it didn't make any sense. Nobody saw her walk into the water. Nobody called and said, gee, my mom's hasn't been home for hours. We're worried about her. They just all of a sudden said, oh, they got a woman in the water. Get get the, the troops out there. You know, how do they know she didn't go out for coffee with her friends? How do they know she wasn't bludgeoned to death behind the church? So they, they just immediately decided this was a suicide, and I don't believe they ever did a proper investigation. We're hoping that, you know, the feds will take a look at this case. Yeah. Now, so do you think, do you have an idea of who you think might have committed the crime and to what advantage? We think that it was involving family matters. I don't want to get too specific here, but um, there was a cousin uh, named in a federal lawsuit. Tim Matuk was named as Mm -hmm. a suspect in a federal lawsuit. So I can say that. So that's one of the people that um, the family is suspicious of. And that there was a lot of dysfunction in this family. And Joanne's brother um, was involved in, uh, he was the executor of the grandmother's estate, the mother of uh, Joanne. Romaine and um, money turned up missing and she had to sue him, could have prosecuted, but didn't. So there was a lot of dysfunction in this family. So our theory is that there was some criminal activity going on somewhere in the family. The police were aware of it. They were looking the other way. And we think that Joanne found out something important and they were afraid she was going to go to the feds. And in fact, Scott Bernstein reported in his recent story that was funded by Google and ran in the Gross Point News that um, she indeed, he confirmed with sources that she indeed did meet with FBI agents a couple of weeks before she went missing. Um, is that the kind of cases you typically work now, or do you ever get to do the um, affairs? Like you're trying to bust somebody on an affair. Like what, what kind of cases do you do now? I mean, that's a pretty heavy case. Yeah, most of them are not that long term and that that heavily involved. And, you know, I did um, so much work on that federal lawsuit. Um, but it's, you know, the thing is, um, Mark, it's one of the reasons this business is so much fun is I didn't think anything could be more fun than TV news. But every time the phone rings, it's a new adventure. It's somebody looking for their birth mom. It's um it's a, a lady whose daughter is um, getting ready to marry some guy and he's creeping her out <laughs> and wants us to investigate him. It's somebody that got ripped off for a million dollars and they have to have us find assets for people. Um, We do do surveillance. Um, Cheating spouses is my least favorite job. Why is that? We're expensive. Why is it? Yeah. It's a no-win situation. Um, And it's very emotional. If you catch the person cheating, the person who hired you is devastated. You know, their life is turned upside down, especially if they have children. Sure. If you don't catch them, um, they've spent all t- tons of money. It's very expensive to do surveillance and they have not gotten any results and they're left in limbo. So I think that's my least favorite surveillance. Um, we did just finished about two weeks of surveillance on um, a custody case where a guy is trying to get custody of his kids. He was supposedly up to some no good. So we watched him over a period of maybe six or seven days um, during a couple of weeks span. Uh, we do, I do a lot of um, criminal defense and criminal appeals. And this appellate stuff, you guys, has gone off the hook. I'm telling you, my name is a household word, word in every prison in Michigan. And this was not part of my business plan. I had no idea that I would end up working on wrongful convictions. But what happened, one of my last investigations, I did my last three years at Channel 7, one of the last investigation was on these two guys, Justly Johnson and Kendrick Scott, who had served 19 years in prison for a murder. Mother's Day. And I believe that they were innocent. And during my investigation on TV, I uncovered a new witness. It was her eight-year-old son who the police had never interviewed. So I tracked him down and interviewed him. The Michigan Innocence Clinic stepped in um, I left TV and kept working on the case. Eventually, the Michigan Supreme Court overturned the convictions based on the information I got from the son who said he witnessed the murder and it was neither of these guys. And um, those guys walked out in 2019 and it was one of the greatest days of my life. So what happened is in prison, people know everything. People talk. And um, they started hearing. I realized this is... Um, uh, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? Or it's a market where there's more demand than there is 
or people to serve it. It, um, there were some PIs that were working with inmates and on, uh, and, and appellate attorneys, but a lot of them really didn't understand appellate law. And I learned a lot from the University of Michigan Innocence Clinic because after I became a PI, I left to step out. I started doing pro bono work for them. So I would gain the experience of how the legal system works and, and appeals work, and they would get free investigative work from me. It was a win-win situation. I'm still doing it to this day, and my wife Nancy does it. So um, once I got those two guys out, then I got a, another guy out named Mubariz Ahmed, who was had done 17 or 18 years for a murder. Um, I tracked down a witness that the police made up her, said she was his girlfriend. She had never met the guy. And Jeez. also tracked down the only eyewitness who admitted that um, the police told her they were going to put her kids in prison if she didn't pick him out of the lineup, threw the, um, pick his picture on the table and said, that's the mf -er that did it. Now get in there and pick him out. And it took oh. me a year and a half to get her to sit down and talk to me. And then she broke down crying, signed an affidavit. And with those two pieces of evidence, his case also got reversed. So that gets around in the prisons and I'm an honest guy. I don't take advantage of people. I get the jobs done quickly and I know what I did. So I know what I'm doing in this area. So believe it or not, you guys, I've gotten almost a thousand um, contacts from prison inmates in Michigan, some from, you know, across the country. Um, obviously I can't help all of them, but I have answered every single letter. Well, wow. let, let's, let's just say out of those thousand, how many are legitimate do you think? Um, I know you'll look at say, them. All, they say the wrongful conviction rate, they estimate it to be something like three or 4%. I think in Michigan, you guys, I wouldn't be surprised if it's 15 or 20%. Oh my um, God. And all of these bad cases came out of, not all of them, but a, a high percentage of them came out of Wayne County, um, where they had a really dirty homicide unit in the late 80s, Bill 90s, Rice. and early 2000s. They were intimidating witnesses. They were making up witnesses. They were doing all kinds of shenanigans. And the attitude of some of these investigators was, well, you know, um, this guy's a dope man anyway. He's a thorn in our side. He doesn't belong on the street. So, you know, let, you know, let's just put a murder on him. And they were doing that routinely. So I would say it could be 10, 15, even 20% in the state of Michigan. It's much higher than most people think. And then for the, the ones that aren't um, innocent. Sometimes people will come right out and acknowledge that they, they committed the crime, but they're trying to get a sentence reduction or they didn't get a fair trial. There were things done during their trial that were unconstitutional. And in this country, everybody deserves a fair trial. And that's why you have appellate attorneys. Everybody deserves an appeal to make sure they got a fair trial. But, you know, the stories are, you know, they would be hair raising if I had any left. I mean, the stories <laughs> I hear from these inmates and they're the, the ones that I, I'm pretty sure are innocent. I, there's benchmarks. I can tell by the way they're talking and the way they behave that they probably are innocent. And the other thing I found is that the guys in prison who are really innocent tend to group with each other and they know, they know who's naughty and who's nice. So I, I'm just thinking of those investigations on the cheating spouses where where it turns out they weren't cheating. Have you ever had a situation where a client calls you and says, Hey, uh, Scott, um, so I may need you to do some divorce work because my wife saw a $2,000 bill to Scott Lewis and asked me why. And I said, well, cause I thought you were a tramp and it turns out you weren't. And she says, well, now I am. Has that ever happened? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an awfully happen, specific question. When we um, do our credit card statements, we don't put Scott Lewis private investigation oh, on for that okay. reason. <laughs> okay. It's skankwatch.com. No. Okay. So uh, be before we let you go, I I'm dying to know uh, when you look back over a, a, uh, a very illustrious career on TV, what your favorite story was. And then if you could tell us how difficult it was to get that PI license, because as someone with some investigative skills, who's in a business that seems to be going down the drain. I, I, I could use a little career advice here before we let you go. <laughs> I don't want the competition. <laughs> you don't want to be a PI. <laughs> I need the money. I'll just hire Kids them then. Shoes. I'll, I'll stock I, I the champs. Um, my favorite investigations, I two come to mind. One was um, Lonnie Bates when he oh. had the <laughs> women on the payroll, the ghost oh. employees. Yes. Um, that, that, that just started with a uh, email from a woman who made up a fake name and worked, um, in government. And she told me this was going on. This took some real, um, you know, the real gumshoe work. This was real gumshoe work. But what made me especially proud is, you know what it takes to get information out of the city of Detroit? You know, yeah. it's a FOIA and it goes on forever. So 
Um, once I had evidence that he had a woman in New York going to college on his payroll and another woman who was working as a nurse uh, on the east side, um, both on the payroll, I confronted him going into the office in yeah. the morning and he denied it was going on. So I needed the time cards because I had video to show the one lady was in New York and I had time records for the schedule for the other lady. So I somehow went up to an, the office that kept records for the city council and talked them into giving me these time cards on the spot. And wow. he was walking out of the office that night and I was waiting for him and I ambushed him on the way to the car and uh, he didn't say a word. He just, uh, you know, kind of whistled, got in the car and drove away and our cameraman had to dodge out of the way. But that next morning he was on Mildred Gaddis's radio show saying this was all a bunch of BS. He's not doing anything that everybody doesn't do. And I had my photographer at Mildred station because they tipped me that the FBI called and we got video of the FBI walking in to get a recording of, um, of that interview. So literally the next day the FBI investigated, uh, Lonnie Bates ended up getting convicted and they found all kinds of other um, bogus people on the payroll. I think he did about two and a half years in prison. And the other one I'm extremely proud of is there was a serial killer preying on prostitutes yeah. on the east side of Detroit. And I got a call from a payphone. Um, woman left a message. She didn't have a number. She said, go to the address, this address on Fisher on the east side of Detroit. It's near Mack and Bewick. At that time, a very dangerous area. I went over there. It was still a not so house. great. <laughs> What's that? It's, it's still not so great. Yeah, I'm sure. Sean got um, a so call I, like that one time, and she just said, come pick up your pants. <laughs> but the wallet was so, gone. So Imagine I went that. to this house, and um, it was a vacant house. And a guy comes outside, and he says, um, but she's not here right now. Um, I think her name was Shayla or something like that. So I um, kept going back until I caught her there, and she told me, she says, Scott, there's a guy out here preying on women. I think he's killed at least 10 or 11 women. We know it's someone from the neighborhood. We know he's a crackhead. We know he's giving the women drugs and then he's, you know, he's killing them. But all they had is names like Pee Wee and Little Bit. They didn't have these women's real names. So I had to, to find the real names of the street, connect them to the street names and then find out how they died and where they died and then mapped it out. And I found, I think, seven murders in a one and a half square mile area within a period of two years. And, um, the police um, head of homicide at the time denied there was any serial killer. They, he said there was just one prostitute murdered. Then I started finding more and more and more and kept the pressure on until they formed a task force. And then um, what, one day, a woman was beaten within an inch of her life. His MO was he'd get him into a garage or a vacant lot and pummel him with whatever was Ugh. handy, a rock, a brick, a wood, a piece of wood. And so this woman is beaten uh, senseless, but she survived. They made a sketch. We put it on TV, and they got a call, and they, they named this guy. His name was Shelley Brooks. They picked yeah. him up. He confessed to a bunch of them. They found his DNA. They convicted him of four murders. They had charged him with eight, and they believed that he had killed 12 women. Jeez. So th that, to me, was the uh, kind of the... Um, the essence of journalism where you, you, you know, you, you provide power to the powerless. Well, and, and the, the, the other thing is you're challenging the orthodoxy. I mean, we, we defer to public officials so often. And if the police mm -hmm. say it's so, as you're finding with these wrongful convictions, a lot of people just say, huh, it must be, it must be the way it works. And we found far too often in this city and the free press has done some groundbreaking work in terms of police uh, shooting yeah. folks perhaps without justification that, mm -hmm. that we have a better system and that this place is safer. I mean, Schaefer and I used to say this all the time, you know, who watches the watchmen? Well, it, it's, it's us, it's the reporters, it's the fourth estate, mm -hmm. it's Scott Lewis. It's people mm -hmm. who are holding folks accountable when everybody else is afraid to, because politicians hate to criticize cops. They would rather cut their own throat than right. get the cops against them. And, and who is it? It's a bunch of pencil pushers and geeks like us who, uh, you know, don't have a gun, don't have a badge, don't have uh, anybody they can call, but we're out there uh, sticking our neck out to try and yep. make things better. And Scott's still doing it. So, Scott, God bless you. We're, we're so glad that you are still in the game. And mm -hmm. uh, 
And uh, I guess Mark Mark is confessing to something. Hold on a second. Are we <laughs> oh, really? On this? No, I just wanted. Oh. There, were, there were two questions on our Facebook Live that I, I don't know if you can um, talk about. Did you ever look into or work on the Danielle Stizlicky case? Um, do you know that case? Did, did you um, do any work? I, the name is familiar. I think I might have been contacted on that case. Um, I remember it was a really, really difficult case, I, but yeah. I don't recall all the details. Yeah, no body. Um, and, might have been contacted on it, but I don't think I ever worked it. Were you happy? Andrew wants to know, were you happy with the way the Unsolved Mysteries uh, did that episode? And were they very accurate or did you have problems at all with how that was done? Well, I would answer that question saying it is what it is. Um, they could, there's a lot of detail that was left out of that story that would convince the average person that this was a murder and something really sinister happened. On the other hand, the format of the show is to present, this is a really mysterious thing that happened. Um, so some people say it's this, some people say it's that, you know, and show both sides of the story as much as possible, although they had to use clips from, um, from depositions because the police wouldn't talk. But um, so for what it was, and then see if you can get a tip, get tips in, I think it was pretty well done and it raised awareness. And the other thing it did, it caused spinoff stories all over the world. Yeah. So people saw that and then they did more stories, more information came out. So I think it was a pretty decent job. Um, I think they should have had me in there a lot more. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you look pretty good on that boat, man. You're commandeering. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was the J.W. Westcott, the mail boat. Oh, yeah. Which sank and they, it was their brought up from the boat, water. They sent a, put a second crew on their backup boat so they could be on a boat shooting us on a boat. They spent a ton of money, you guys. A ton of money. It looked good. I mean, it's a good show. It was entertaining. Yeah, it was a good show. Mm -hmm. It's a it's an interesting story, and I hope one of these days um, we'll just get that one piece of information that'll pull it together. Or like I said, um, the feds will step in. And you know how it goes with the feds. Maybe they, they're looking at it. Who knows? Yeah, the uh the feds they 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 move on their own clock, but uh but Scott is uh both a, a gracious colleague, a, a tenacious investigator, and I, I've always you know, I, I always have a lot of respect for people who look out for, for others. And uh one of your investigations that I, I don't think was ever resolved, but you were the only guy who was looking into the the death of our former colleague uh, at Channel Four, uh, Boomer, when he died under yeah. very questionable circumstances there in um, in uh, Sarnia? So uh, Scott's a guy who not only looks out for everybody, he looks out for for friends, colleagues, and competitors. So if you're looking for what the English would call a solid gold geezer. That's him right there, man. We really appreciate it, Scott. Thank you. Can I say something quickly about Bob Bennett? Sure. About that you just referenced. Um, we called him Boomer. When I came to Detroit from Milwaukee, I was just a snot-nosed kid, and I was scared shitless, to be honest with you, <laughs> working in, at that time, the fifth largest market. And Boomer put his arm around me, said, come on, Milwaukee, we're going to go out and have some fun. And he talk, took me to a African-American club, and Bob was kind of like my guardian angel, Um because he knew I was just a, a young kid from a small town in Wisconsin. So we got to be pretty good buddies. And when he was found in the river on the Canadian side and they called it a suicide, I was watching Channel 4 and they just did like a VO on it. And I'm, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this man's a legend in Detroit. He he broke down so many barriers as, a, as an African-American reporter. He was a hell of a good guy and people just loved him. I said, that story deserves more attention, even though at that time people didn't like to cover suicides. So I went out and just um, explained to people what happened in his life. And there were some signs that he was getting depressed after he, he left the news business, which was so important in his life. But there were also some really shady things about the story yeah, that didn't add up. Absolutely. Um, so I thought, let's give Bob a proper send off and tell people what happened. And I, w I was happy to do that story. And I heard there was a little bit of um, maybe embarrassment or I don't know what in the, in the newsroom at channel four that another station did it, but. Well, good. Well, oh well. Shame those sons of bitches. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you can't look out for your own, you, you're not worth a tinker's damn in my book, but uh, he was a great guy. And I, and uh, he was the, the King of Ham Tramick, right? <laughs> was yes. He yes. <laughs> quite a man about town in Hamtown. So uh, yep. loved to fish, loved Canada. Um, and Bob always carried a bankroll. Anytime he walked into a bar, <laughs> he'd have a wad of money and he'd 
buy the whole bar a, a drink. He was, awesome. he was just the nicest guy in the world. And um, that was the other suspicious thing. When he was found in the water, he had his belt on and his pants were around his ankles. And he, they found like a um, couple of dollars and change in the water um, next to his body. And he was right across the street from a strip club where he used to hang out. Bob used to like to go to the strip clubs. And so I remember the talking to Dr. Spitz. And, and Dr. Spitz said, there's no way that wave action on the edge of the river could take pants down with a belt like that. That's very suspicious. At the time, Bob was also walking with a cane. And the cane was left uh, up in his car. And it was kind of a steep embankment he would have had to come down to get to the, the water, um, the water's edge. So I always thought there was at least a possibility that he was at the strip club and somebody saw the bankroll and rolled him. Oh, you know? Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a pretty good theory. And, uh, God bless the, uh, state police, the OPP in, in, uh, Ontario, but the Ontario provincial police are not known. Let, let's just say no one's ever going to confuse them with Scotland yard. So, uh, so Scott, <laughs> thanks for, Thanks for what you do. Thanks for what you're still doing. And yeah. w- where do people find out what, how to get a hold of you and what you're up to and uh, perhaps even get you on a case? Um, they can go to my website. It's easy, scottlewispi.com. Um, I've got an 800 number, uh, 855-411-LEWIS. That's the best way to contact me. I do have Facebook pages, but that's not a good way to reach me because I'm so busy. I don't always have time to go on and chase, uh, ch- uh, check the messages on Facebook. So, sure. yeah, and we're, you know, people, one thing that I'll tell you, if people call us, we give them a straight answer. If we can't help you, we're going to tell you we can't help you. And we tell more people we can't help them than we do. And there's a couple of places out there, um, guys, that are just straight out crooks in the PI business. And I actually tried to get the media to look into one of them, not to be self-serving, because I, I don't need the business at yeah, this point. You're busy but, enough. But this company is just a, a disgrace to our profession. And the sad thing is that you need to be licensed in Michigan, but there's no police. Um, uh, um, policing of, of the rules of the game. So uh, nobody investigates if there are complaints. And you were asking earlier how to become a PI. There, there, there are some hoops you have to jump through, and I, you might have to have a, a degree in um, criminal justice. But what made this a no-brainer for me is I found out that when I was in TV that Michigan is the only state in the United States where you can get a PI license if you have, I think it's five years experience as an investigative reporter hey. at a bona fide news organization. Huh. So just like a retired cop, all I had to do is pass the background check, pay the money, get some references and get my, um, my bond and my insurance. And I was licensed. So I already knew how to investigate. What I had to do was learn the business. How, how do you write a report? How do you build people? So I had a good friend who has a huge PI company and he let me come out to his company and basically intern for a month or so. And I sat with everybody in, in, in the place and just learned the business of PI work. And the, the thing is, I, I'd still like to write a lot. And so I write a lot of reports and affidavits and I enjoy the hell out of it. And, um, the thing is, I don't have to have some sexy lead on it. You know, I can write it like the cops. <laughs> we, we, we observe the subject. <laughs> That's right. If Complaint I said observe says, the subject when I was on Fox 2, they would have fired me. I oh. saw the guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I, the nitwit ran. You still look camera ready, though, man. You, you don't look like you've aged a day. It's crazy. No, oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I turned 69 in uh, September. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Damn. Well, Scott, thanks for joining us. We, uh, we look forward to uh, seeing, I guess, on, on Dateline again with another big case. But in the meantime, <laughs> hopefully when we run into you, it's for beers, not because you're keeping an eye on us. Perfect. No, <laughs> I don't think I'd find much with you guys. It'd probably be a wasted mission. But, yeah, um, absolutely. I really appreciate you having me on. This has been fun. And um, I think it's so cool the way these podcasts are popping up. And, you know, you don't have to be tied to a big organization anymore the best. To, to get out to the public and put on a good show. This is, this is cool stuff. Well, well, we'll have you back on. I, yeah. I, know, right. I know you got yeah. more cases and more stories. So, uh, so count on that and, uh, tell, uh, tell Mrs. Shamus we said, Hey, and, um, okay. and, uh, and we'll catch you soon. Thank you. All Scott. Right. Thanks guys. Thanks Scott. Thank you. Scott. Uh, if you missed it this weekend, um, there was an article in the free press talking about trying to preserve the great entertainment venues in Detroit and the the bars and restaurants that that have contributed so much to the fabric of our fine city. And we're going to talk to uh, 
to uh, John Rutherford and Darren Nichols. Darren is the author of that column, and John Rutherford is one of the places we want to keep open. But first, I need to tell you about a place that is is doing pretty well, and one of the reasons it's doing so well is because of the support of listeners and viewers like you, and that is The Butchery, which is on Orchard Lake Road, just west of Middle Belt. Uh, if you go by there now, you will see the extraordinary facade of that building. And that is because our own Matt Jennings was out there uh, decorating the, uh, the the windows. I don't know if Matt can hear us, but Matt, was this something you did as part of a public service thing? Were you sentenced to do this or is this just expressing uh, yeah, yourself as an artist? I sentenced my bank account to, uh, <laughs> to paint a beautiful mural for the holidays. <laughs> yeah, Matt is a very good artist too. So if anybody wants a mural. This, well, we knew he yeah, wasn't much on a comedy, so we figured it may, <laughs> the truck driving into artistry, we figured it has got to be where his, 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 uh, his gifts lie. Right, Matt? I guess, I guess he has no comment on that. Okay. Well, um, so anyways, <laughs> you can go out there and see Matt's mural, or you know what you can do? You can get some of their fantastic sausages, all made in-house from scratch by Chef Dave. And occasionally, Mr. Jennings will uh, will dip into the uh, sausage making a little bit. It's a lot nicer than the sausage making that Darren Nichols and I saw when we were working in City Hall. Uh, if you go to thebutcherysl.com, you can see all their great selections. They not only will sell you terrific stuff right there at the counter at a very cool store, which has all kinds of neat things, uh, some great beers at uh, really good prices, some wonderful breads and uh, dairy products and some great cookies by Chef Julie. Sean and I were there. Sean Sean was very impressed, if, as I recall. Absolutely. And he's a hard man to impress. No, that's not true. And with the holiday. <laughs> I ate a uh, uh, breakfast sandwich from a fast food joint this morning. Were you okay. impressed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, well, if you want to show off for your um, your holiday, I guess a stay at home holiday, they'll you can order special meats from him too. He's got a bunch of. He was telling me a lot of uh, special cuts of beef and pork and whatnot that you can get for the holidays. The rib so, roast I saw there, yeah, beautiful, dry aged, yeah. I don't know, two three thousand years. It was uh, <laughs> it was spectacular looking. So check that one out. might be a little tougher than the average beef that they sell there, which is mostly just tender. Well, it breaks it down a little bit, but let's not get into that. Dave, Dave will point you. You stick to your chicken breast. Dave will point you in the right direction when you go to the butchery. So. And and just if I could just leave you with one word, marbling. It's 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 marvelous. That's the meat at the butchery. Okay. And you can call them at 248-682-COWS. That's 248-682-COWS. They are not open on Wednesdays. Every other day, go there and get some good stuff. Uh, ButcheriesL.com. Great meat. Can't be beat. And go see Matt Jennings art, which I'm told is a visual feat. Oh, okay. Anyways, that's the butchery. So we appreciate their support. Please, when you get there. Let them know that ML sent you. You could even mention Sean. They, they don't, they're not real picky over there. So, uh, Darren, um, great column in the, uh, in the free press talking, uh, primarily to PJ of PJ's Lager House, which is not only a, uh, Corktown institution, a place where a lot of great bands have played, a lot of uh, good beers have been drank and many evenings enjoyed and some even forgotten because they were enjoyed so much. But you talked about a lot of other places that are uh, are kind of uh, I, I don't know if is life support the right word. I mean, t- tell us tell us what your concerns are here. I I, w- I would say so. I mean, given what has been going on with COVID, um, the, the the gist of the story is that you know you have you have a lot of local uh, neighborhood bars in the city that didn't get PPP loans. Um, that are lifeblood of what's going on, and they may be in jeopardy as a result of what's been going on. Um, they rely strictly on patron patrons who come in and, and and dance and you know sit down, have a drink at the bar, and that sort of thing. And um, they are they have been sent essentially closed for a long time because they don't really sell a lot of food um, to people in in their neighborhood. So as a result. Um, not just, uh, PJs, but I'm sure several others, um, probably will not be able to make it, uh, past, uh, the shutdowns. I thought one of the interesting things in the article was a comment, um, from Paul regarding PJ's Lager House about, um, what he thinks about the governor and the lockdowns, because you hear a lot in the media 
of uh, restaurants that are just flat out mad about it and refuse to adhere to um, her rules. What, what did, what did Paul tell you about the governor? Yeah. Paul said in, in essence that she has been doing a good job um, and that, um, you know, he understood everything that was going on. Um, but, you know, his, his, that essentially she's doing her job. Um, and that as or he knows that she, uh, the, the state or he may not be able to survive as a result, but at the same time, uh, they are doing a great job in terms of handling COVID in, in a state. It, what was your favorite bar that you talked about? I, I, I think I read about the Capri Lounge, which the last time I was there, we were trying to find some people who could talk to us about what's going on at the Packard plant, which I think is just a, a block or two east of there, which is a totally cool little place, one of those spots with, with no windows. You go in there, it's, it's, it's dark all the time, but there's always music bumping, there's always people hanging out, and it kind of seems like the place where if you're from the neighborhood or you used to live in the neighborhood – when you go there, you're, you're home. Uh, on the Detroit's West side, since that's around, uh, was another spot where, where I went to, um, you know, uh, Teresa's is a great place. Um, all, all, all the places that I mentioned I had been to just Chuck's millionaires bar, uh, on Plymouth. Um, th- there were a number of places that I had, uh, gone to over the years, you know, including PJs as well. And and they're all great places. You can you can find out more about them by checking out Darren's story at freep.com. And we're joined now by John Rutherford, and he has doubled down during the, the pandemic by not just saying, well, we're gonna we're gonna take the shutdown as a chance to sort of um gussy up a little bit, but but John, tell people about my favorite place on the east side, Muscle Beach, and what you've done on the outside of the Cadu. Official uh, ML Elric's hangout, right? That's, uh, <laughs> That's what can, he wants it to can, be. You can find me sleeping under one of those picnic tables just about any night. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, you know, we shut down on March 16th, um, and then we stayed shut down till July 31st. And during that time, then just, you know, being the two week, three week intervals, it, it, it's hard to plan. So we just, you know, what we're just going to stay closed. We uh, added this 5,000 uh, square foot outdoor beer garden area with a, a large 20 by 12 stage um, trussing lighting. Uh, we added a, a, a bar um, behind the Cadu, uh, the normal bar area. And in our garage, we have a garage bar. My cousin, uh, Frank Alter came in from New York to, uh, to build that. And that's, that was a real hit. Um, we found a beer garden in, in Germany that was going out of business I was on uh, just trolling the internet one night about 3 a.m. and found all these these great official like authentic beer garden tables and benches and we ordered about 40 of those so we had everything was spread out um, I think we had a really good run um, and you know we've been shut down now for well it's, uh, what about three weeks now and and um, how how are you surviving were you able to get um, a grant or a PPP loan we had some of the uh, disaster loans and and PPP yes. And that's been enough for you, do you think? I mean, it, there's not like no, a date where no, it's like de- definitely not, definitely not. Yeah. Um, you know, we're 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 hoping that you know in the next few weeks or something's going to come through. Um, it seems like it has to. Uh, so, what other ways are there to to generate revenue? I mean, is there a, a GoFundMe? Are you doing anything? Maybe people can pay it forward. Uh, what I mean, how what do you do? That's that's I think what the big question is. What what do these bars and restaurants do to survive? Well, you know, we, uh, we just added a store on our uh, website, kajucafe.com backslash store, and we have gift cards for sale. We'll, we'll be adding merchandise oh. soon. Um, we're just kind of starting to get that, that ramped up. Um, because honestly, I, I don't even, I don't think we're going to be open in two weeks. I don't, I don't think that that's going to, or the 12 days. I, I think yeah. this, this is going to, this is going to go till, till February. February. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think I it's a- heard, I've heard, I've heard, you know, industry people mention March 18th as, as, as the key date, which would be uh St. Patrick. So we're going to come back. <laughs> Boy, that's, that's, that's when we went out, wasn't it? I mean, right. I, I, I think we had you on the show just before yeah. the yeah. shutdown. So I'm going to go to kajucafe.com right now and uh, I'm going to find out how easy this is. My card is empty. Oh dear. Okay. Let me see. Gift cards available. I'm going to click here. I'm going to order a gift card. Um, I'm going to go with the virtual card here, John. I'm going to save you the, I'm going to save you the postage and I'm going to go with two fifty 
These you can do these for two dollars and fifty cents. Jeez, that's still worth your time. Cheap. That might be a misprint. Oh wait, well, well, let's see. Let's see. I'm going to do it from ML to ML. Um, do you even know what you're doing? I'm I'm figuring out this. Is technology. Sean, does he even know what he's doing? No. I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're so positive. There's a message. Of course he knows what he's doing. I just like the fact that ML Elric has a brand new iPhone. I do. Um, do we call him ML? Like if you see him on the cart, street, I'm checking out. Call him ML. I always do, yeah. got to put all this information. You know, but Hi, ML. Sean, you know that pained so, him to have to buy a new phone. So I Did he have to trademark ML? Put it on the Amex. <laughs> So, so I'm doing some commerce here. You might as well. Yeah, it's taking forever. No, no, this is easy. This That's is just no. I know. I know it's easy for most That's people. Why I'm finally talking? <laughs> it's the one thing that got him to shut up. Maybe so you should wait buy a us all gift cards. So if if uh, if John goes out of business, Sean stops talking. Uh, John, uh, good luck in all future <laughs> endeavors. I mean, I want you to make it, but the price may just be too high. So let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, you let's... wait. For most people, it's very What's easy it? to that's do. That's my security he a, code. He bought a phone, Mark? And that's it. He had to. John, what, what's the website I'm again? Done. Where can Magic people Cafe.com, C A D I E U X C A F E.com backslash uh, store. For yeah. the, uh, uh, everyone, go if you want to go buy, do it right now and see if you can beat ML before he completes no. his purchase. I'm going to make this. I'm going to do it. Oh, promo code. What's that? Oh, no, never mind. Forget it. I'm just, I'm, I'm paying, exactly. I'm paying. I'm paying this price. We don't have those yet. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. So anyways, folks, this is what you should be doing for the holidays. You should be supporting your local businesses. You should supporting support the places you want to go back to. And you know what? Since you can't go shopping and you want people to get all excited about uh, about when we can get back to normal, it'd be nice to give them a little gift card so that this submit order. Here we go. <laughs> so, John, I, I'm... Uh, I'll be drinking two hundred fifty dollars worth of beers. So keep some in that garage. Bar. How long will that take? Uh, at this rate, it'll take uh, two hundred fifty minutes. <laughs> so, so best of luck to you about guys. A, about a day. Yeah. Oh, hey, and you know what? I got to raise a glass to Darren because it's Darren's fiftieth birthday. Today. Happy oh. birthday, man! Happy birthday, Darren! Thank you, man. Thank Happy you guys. birthday, Darren! Thank you guys, appreciate it. Darren, thanks <laughs> for your work for the Free Press. John, thanks for keeping the lights on over at the Cadu, and we hope to be there. Yes. For St. Patrick's Day next year. For sure. Thank you. I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Pray not. Pray so. Pray not. Pray so. Pray not infinity. Pray so infinity plus one. No. If you're looking for another great gift, in fact, if you're going to head out to the Cadu or Thomas McGee's or Irish coffee or the traffic jam or any of these great watering holes and restaurants that uh, that we love uh, maybe go to bogart's there on mac in uh, in detroit uh, you want to look your best and one way to do that is with the lawnmower 3.0 or the weed whacker basically that'll get every part of your body looking so nice and trim and svelte from head to bone from head to yes i mean uh is it uh is it a great gift taint a bad one Let's put it, let's put it that way. Um, if your jingle balls oh are goodness. getting a little, are, oh are, it's a legitimate product. It's if, great. If they're not hung with care, <laughs> they, the lawnmower 3.0 will get you there. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, here's the beautiful thing: if you go to manscaped.com and use promo code ML, you will get a generous discount on your order plus free shipping. Now I know you're probably thinking that uh, that you, know, you I, that you said taint. And was very proud of his pun. Yeah, I know. It was, it was pretty good. Why um, don't you say twat? Whoa, like, hey. You can shave is, that, this too. Is for, this is a show for- You can for, shave all of it, Sean. This is a show for gentlemen. This isn't like uh, <laughs> Ann Arbor, where you guys think you can say anything under the First Amendment. We have or some, England, right? They love that word there. They, they do. But they don't try to hide it like you just did. You they know? like the C if, word if, there, if too, gonna, but we're They we're do. If you're gonna, If you're going to use these words, just say them. You know, quit trying to hide- delicately i I have, I have nothing to hide which is why i'm so closely shorn so closely cropped so <laughs> that everything can be right there on display really? and uh and and um and lovingly packaged and speaking of lovingly packaged you can get boxers with part of their perfect package there's a luxury nail kit if you just want to make sure that your hands look look pristine or there's the crop cleanser the two-in-one shampoo and body wash that is dye free 
Uh, great stuff. Smell has a nice kind of eucalyptus smell. Eight ninety nine. You can't beat that. If you go to manscaped.com and make any of these purchases, spend a, a fair amount, you know, if you somewhere around 50 bucks or so, and you send us proof. Uh, and there's, oh, there's, look at that. That's the weed whacker. That gets your nose and your ears looking like they did when you were a cute little baby instead of a creeping old, <laughs> decrepit, drippy, hairy mess. Those days can come back. I promise you. Um, you put that promo code ML in there and send us proof of purchase and we will get you on a future show. You'll be a part of our zoom green room where you can watch our pre-flight checkup and uh, our post mortem and everything in between. All you got to do is do a little business this month with manscaped.com and uh, it's a great gift and it's, it's strong enough for a man, strong enough for a lady. And, um, just do it. Just go buy it. Just shave the hell out of each other. That's that's one way. That to sounds all great. What is the pre-flight checkup and the the postmortem? That's, Mike will be great. Mike was that's, great. That's usually <laughs> that's usually what we do when you're sneaking in. Okay. Yeah. So so you're Sean, usually just on your phone and Mark's doing all the work of putting the the, the sound together. You know. The you know what I'm typing on my phone. Ten minutes. Sean, where where's Sean? Where are you, Sean? <laughs> that's in the pre-show. Sean, yeah. It's a part. It's part. Okay. It's a ritual. It's okay. a ritual. We're, we're ritualistic. <sighs> with the shaving or just with the prepping? You'll have to get in the green room. You'll find out. Man. Oh, okay. All, all yeah. will be revealed. Use yeah. promo code ML. Defoliation. Nice. Nice. Right. Manscaped.com, promo code ML. Uh, ML makes you look well and a nice smell. And it's swell. And you're you're just determined to make everything rhyme today. T- ain't a bad way to live. What are we debating? Oh, uh, Daryl Bevel. Uh, wow. He's got those lions performing it at optimal <laughs> Uh, levels this Wait. is the fords need look no further than uh, retain the uh what do you Darryl- care you hate no. them you don't like the lions and you don't like sports and by the way last week on facebook uh, live some of our listeners said uh viewers i guess both right said this is not a sports podcast <laughs> so what are we doing <laughs> talking about uh, daryl bevel well i just think the lions is kind of the local tragedy and you don't care about them Wait, they're the local tragedy i would say michigan is but well, let's talk about them i like you don't like them. the lions uh, no, but Daryl Bevel, we've seen this before where a Lions coach has a little run and they're like, well, you know, we've, they've kind of got rid of Patricia with enough games left in the season to see whether Bevel can, uh, can do anything with these jokers, try and get them in the playoffs. Now, if he takes a team that couldn't get out of its own way, that was routinely blowing, blowing double digit leads and turns them into a playoff team, there will be people who say this Daryl Bevel's a winner. He's got a Super Bowl ring from Seattle. Let's put this guy in charge. We need look no further. He made the bums that we have win. This is this is it. This this doesn't mean a complete teardown. This is a way to uh, carry some momentum into next season. The players seem to like him. Everybody, blah 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 blah. So why not retain Daryl Bevel if the if the uh, Leos really seem to regain there's, their a very, roar. there's a very good reason not to retain him um okay remember when bob quinn came in and he had caldwell for a year but it wasn't his guy and he blew him out yeah but that was a mistake i liked caldwell of course it was a mistake the problem is you got to hire a gm too and if they don't mesh together then then you're in that situation again but if the question is you know can he do anything to become the head coach of course he's, i mean they have a, a very rough and tough schedule going forward and it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the players rallied around him at halftime. The first uh, first half wasn't so good, and they seem to they seem to like the guy. So if he pulls off the miracle of all miracles, the Lions would be stupid to not look at him. So yeah, why not? I mean, you're taking a chance on everybody else. Yeah, right. Uh, especially unless you're going to go hire a former head coach. But even then, that that head coach was probably let go for some reason. Uh, I mean, Jim Caldwell worked out fairly well here, but you're. If you're hiring a defensive or an offensive coordinator from another team, you're rolling the dice. You don't know sure. it. The, the the move from the chair in that spot, running the offense and the defense, to running everything is a big one. So and, if, you, and you don't know. I mean, look, Mike took a chance on me. He took a well, – Mark was a known commodity. But, hardly. You yeah, know, but it's, so my judgment is The suspect. other Mike took a chance on this Mike or ML, I guess. It's, yeah. But yeah. So, so, so you're saying if he wins out or does well, keep him. Yeah. There's be no, I mean, why not? If he can, if he can show something, uh, that, that Patricia and, and could not in what, almost three years, not quite three years, and they play for him and you can see the body language and the difference in tone and all of that. And people dismiss that, but that matters. It, you know, people think, well, they're just, it's all about strategy and talent and scheme and all that. And that's all important at the NFL, but it's still, 
They're not robots. How much right. do um, like the main veterans of a team, do they get any say and should they get any say in uh, in who the coach is, in your opinion, Sean? Mm, uh, probably not. Yeah. I mean, in the NBA, work it may work a little bit like that, depending on the situation. Different you know. kind of contract. That worked exactly. that way in Cleveland, didn't it? Yeah, in L.A., right, with uh, LeBron and so forth. But that's that's different. One player can can make you know, the franchise. The best newspaper in France is called Le Monde, which is means the world. And the way they pick their editor in chief is the staff votes. Can you imagine that? Well, the pro- the problem is though is there's the the careers are so short of NFL players in general. I mean, they could be gone, you know, in in any time. So I I do agree. Yeah, they shouldn't pick it. But when you have a big veteran, because the other question they have is, what are they going to do with Matthew Stafford? I mean, he clearly likes Bevel. Well, I think he's leaving, right? Doesn't it? They can't wait to get out of this dictatorship. Isn't that the deal? Isn't that what his I wife. heard? Oh, that was his wife. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Then I guess Matt's okay. Well, I don't know. To me, this is one of these situations where you do the classic uh, national search to find the best person out there. I don't think you find a guy – Sure. Who is the fruit of the poison tree? The, uh, the 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 chosen by Patricia, who made so few choices that were good. Uh, you win a few games at the end of the season. Hooray! Huzzah! Maybe you interview him for the full time job, but to me, you don't just hand it over to him. No, and I think no. you raise a good point: is if there's a new GM and he comes in and says, "Well, I don't know about this bevel guy," yeah, that happens. Then, you, then, all you, too then often. we're right back where we started. We could, but there's. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I want to hear music. I want to hear it. There's just no reason to dismiss it because of that. He's his own guy. He could be sitting off to the side saying, I don't like this. I don't like the way this is done. This is done. This is done. And he gets his chance. He's going to change everything. I'm not saying to hire him at all. I'm saying, how do we know he's going to be any better or worse than any other assistant coach out there? We don't. Well, one thing I want to know is when the offense was terrible, was it because Patricia was overruling him all the time or because he wasn't making good decisions all i know is they threw a little bit more at first down the other day they they mm-hmm. threw the ball down the field a little bit more actually a lot more and we don't need to get into all that this is not a sports podcast <laughs> ml but uh in any case yeah th- there were some tweaks so i don't know go forth my man you, you don't you don't know the lines it's okay and you don't care about them so exactly i don't know what you do care about very, very, maybe, very, maybe. very little. Oh, man, the geeks have inherited the earth. The baby Why Jesus. What a sleep door. Does him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek or we're turning into cool guys? Well, now that we got Sean's uh, adrenaline up to 10%, let's just keep <laughs> let's just keep the good times rolling. Sean, would you like to lead off with Geek of the Week? Sure. There are several possibilities. I thought about Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, who's... Oh firing whistleblowers for wanting to publish the COVID numbers down there and then sent in, uh, I don't know, it wasn't, I don't know what uh, law authority agency that was that went in and raided her home and pulled out a gun with her kid and took a computer because, you know, my goodness, she's trying to share the truth. No, then you think about the, uh, is it the sheriff over in, is it Barry County, Bar County? I can't think. Right, Barry County. Barry County is uh, who's trying to sue Michigan. Oh, yeah, Barry County Sheriff Dar Leaf filed a federal lawsuit about voter fraud. Oh um, yeah, you yeah, know what? They're just they're, they're destroying things that they were ordered to destroy. He doesn't want them to destroy. He wants to preserve. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I I think he's uh, almost as corny as his brother Fig Leaf. Yes, yes, yes. But to, so there's nothing to hide. I'm going to go with my geek way. of the week. I, I really want it to be me or Mike. <laughs> Always is. I know, oh. I know, I know. But I'm going to go with the Texas Attorney General. His last name is Paxson. His first name escapes me. That's uh, a weird first name. Ken, maybe. Uh, who's yeah, thanks, suing. Thanks, thanks who's, for putting uh, the back Texas effort. Attorney, the Texas Attorney General is suing and wants to go straight to the Supreme Court. He's suing Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, saying that the the election, claiming fraud, saying that in Georgia specifically there were some 80,000 fraud signatures and then of course in the lawsuit itself there's not one one case they they have no proof they have no evidence of course that none of this anywhere but the texas attorney general is suing four states saying there's fraud so we've got what the hell is going on texas justice right <laughs> texas justice I mean, what what is i mean it when is enough enough so we've, we're gonna have states starting to sue other states over their elections well, I think we've had three counts in Georgia now, and they all confirm Biden's a winner. There was a recount in Milwaukee, and it turned out that 
Biden got more votes. Trump spent $3 million for Biden to get more votes. I would think at this point, it's time to put a pin in this thing, although now it looks like Trump is trying to get the Pennsylvania Speaker of the House to try and get the Congress to undo the votes. of the Same thing in Georgia. They want a special legislative session in that state, right, so they can swap the, swap the electors. But I just, it, it, is it a little worrisome to y'all at all that a, an attorney general from one state is sticking his beak and do a... Uh, no, because states have states have sued states before. I but I, usually, I, re- and when it relates know. to them, when it directly relates no. to them, it's some kind of interstate commerce or something, right? I just haven't. Me personally, I'm kind of done done with it because I haven't oh, seen the evidence. Well, but, but it's all um, I know and that kind of leads fundraising, in, right? Kind of leads. In, well, maybe, but it leads into uh, my gig of the week, which is Congress as a whole, the United States Congress, for dragging their feet for so long to fi- fix and find another COVID-19 relief bill like the CARES Act because it's running out December 31st. They've known it's running out. Everybody in this country is screaming at them to get something done. And now they're making a big to-do about this bipartisan effort for this, uh, I think it's like $908 billion um, that provides you know the extra $300 for unemployment, some more PPP loans, but it's still not done and there's no stimulus checks right before Christmas, which would be a nice little boon to the economy because we know people would spend it. Um, so just the fact that they're dragging on, they keep saying they're going to get it done. I am still very dubious that it will get done. So Congress as a whole. What about the White House, though? There's still monies out there from the last CARES Act that hadn't been distributed in some of these loans. You're talking about the PP loans, right? Con- Congress- or the small business loans went to the big businesses. Exactly. Congress. Which, uh, a certain ah. gentleman said we should just shove that money out as quickly as possible, which turned they out should. They absolutely should. Then that's that's what you said last time, and it ended up the big companies got it when little companies who were supposed to get it didn't. Well, do they use the money on their employees? I'm not sure. I don't know that much. I mean, when there's when there is a recession on, they know know this from 2008 when there was a recession on the horizon, and thankfully it hasn't been. Believe it or not, not nearly as bad as most economists predicted it, which I suppose is the silver lining. But they know when there is a recession on the horizon, the first thing you have to do is get money out there and make the banks stable enough to provide loans for those that need it and just get money to people. And there's going to be people that abuse it. We've seen it. There's going to be companies that abuse it. We've seen it. But for the most part, you have to get money moving again. No, I think that's right. And and we heard from Ben Blackwell last week. If you missed our show with Ben Blackwell of the Dirt Bombs, Cast Records, and Third Man Records, you should definitely check it out. But he said... Third Man Records, believe it or not, has had a pretty much stable year, year over year, because people who got those $1,200 checks went out and bought themselves a turntable, some some LPs, maybe some cool swag. And and you may be sitting here thinking, well, that's kind of frivolous. Shouldn't they have been out there paying their rent or buying some food or doing whatever? Perhaps. But at the same time, when you're buying those LPs and the record players and, and and the cool Third Man jackets, you're keeping the people who produce those working you're keeping the store open you know it's just about putting money in the economy we just talked about darren's article i mean these people need relief and i really i mean the ones that are fighting back on, on mandates and whatnot it's because they're scared and rightfully so because they're being shut down immediately and they're not getting any help from the government to offset that Oh, I'm still waiting to get my so unemployment get it, furlough check in the state of Michigan because they oh, can't I'm, get their I'm with you, Mark. It's, it's get it outrageous. done, man. And then they're going to act like heroes when it's all fucking signed. And it's like, no, you dragged your feet for a long time. And it freaks people out, which is not good for the economy either. And it's freaked businesses out. And it's really, they're the ones that can save it. And yet, I don't, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where it ends. So it's t- tough to beat Congress, although I would argue Congress could be uh, Geek of the Week every week. They're sort of a perennial, like Mister. Possibly. Is it time for? Is week. it time for Matt now? But I will say, <laughs> no, we that got five I, minutes I, of I, ML. Just I have oh some. Oh my god. Oh, I'm sorry. We had, a, <laughs> we had an economy. Uh, I should there. I'm see, just I like. Have see said what any- happens when I don't make it me. <laughs> I shouldn't to, have said anything. To, Mike's uh, trying to say I don't do any prep for this. Every week I look at four or five possibilities, <laughs> but I'm like, well, who am I to judge? I just want to make it my sorry ass. I shouldn't have said anything because then he's, he's, you know, then I'm never gonna have a rant about that. So exactly. go ahead. Exactly. Uh, oh. To my mom and the other three people still listening, um, <laughs> my nominees would be the Sacramento sheriff who refused to enforce COVID health measures, who then tested positive for the virus. The Hawaii couple who knew they were infected but boarded a flight anyway and infected more people. But I'm going to go with the Swingers Club that gave a whole new meaning to the term super spreaders because before they started (laughs) spreading, 
the 2020 Naughty Nolan Swingers Convention on November 14th, they kind of were responsible. There's no dance floor, no, no, um, no, uh, contact. They wanted more flirtatious activity. They did, uh, enforce some strict coronavirus guidelines with testing and masks. If you did not test negative for the coronavirus, you had to test positive for antibodies. Uh, organizers also asked attendees to keep detailed diaries of everyone they had contact with Shit. for more than 10 minutes of the convention, regardless of whether that contact involved sex. But kind of take something out of the swinging when you have to sit yeah. down and ask the people what their name is. And yeah, it's, it's more waving, but maybe it's just like when you go to a convention, you get people to sign your autograph book, but <laughs> Of the 250 people who attended, within two weeks, 41 tested positive for the virus. The first positive case, and this is my favorite, was a wife who tested positive, but her husband did not. Mm. So you wonder if she hooked up? I'm thinking she did. The oh, yeah, organizer- the, of the game. Yes. The organizer says, I wouldn't do it again if I knew then what I know now. Mm. The organizer said, it weighs on me and it will continue to weigh on me until everyone- is 100% better. So naughty Nolan swingers, super spreaders. Yeah. You're my geek of the week. Uh, or geeks of the week. Uh, that was your cue, Mark. It's definitely That's... not operator error. <laughs> the kids are soft. I don't care for that guy. Me neither. Too no. soft. I'm going to pretend like you need to just make my dick go soft. How'd you like that new intro music, Matt? I think it's beautiful. Okay. I have a question for you, Matt. When you hear your yeah. little intro, do you get wood? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've gotten pretty flaccid over that one. I've heard it too many times. Hey, what is that song anyway, Mark? I've been meaning to ask you that forever. I think it's called Soft Things. Oh, God. It's well, not, I guess it's I, different to any love. Is it, is it parentheses, sell, you need parentheses, soft things? <laughs> to, to tell you uh, the honest truth, I have no idea what the song was. And when I was putting it together, I was just like, I don't know, a song for something being soft. And there was one called that. And it was New Wave, so it worked. Oh, dear. Well, yeah, th that's how the sausage got made. You built that visual in like like 30 seconds, right? Mm, sorry for yawning. Well, before, <laughs> we, before we get to the soft history, we're going to talk about a hard topic. And that is... Planning for your retirement, trying to make your money work yeah. for you because you know how hard you work for it. So I am going to make a confession, and you may not be aware of this, but my Kilpatrick royalties don't kick in until the eighth mention of any combination of the words Kwame, Kilpatrick, or Pulitzer. So I am way behind this week. So my financial future is looking pretty sweet. Uh, if you'd like to make a similar arrangement, you can either get your own damn Pulitzer or maybe call Luke Nowacki at Pinnacle Wealth Strategies. He can help you find a way to provide for your retirement future that may or may not involve reading through mayoral sex messages at the Anchor Bar. Call Luke at 248-663-4748. You can find a link to his site on our site. If you get a hold of the Luker, make sure you know he knows that you found out about him from ML Soul of Detroit. And the thing you'll find out as soon as you start talking to Luke is that it will be all about you, sweetheart. Securities and investment advisory services offered through Royal Alliance Associates and member FINRA SIPC. Royal Alliance Associates Inc. is separately owned and other entities and or marketing names. Products or services referenced here are independent of Royal Alliance Associates Inc. Little known yeah, fact, baby. Luke is a manscaping freak. Uh, Mr. Matt Jennings, Professor Jennings, last night we had a study session and it seemed to me like your presentation was ready to the to bring to the class um uh please don't please don't prove me wrong i will try not to but i can't make any promises you have a pretty good connection this week i know well verizon baby all right well i'm, I'm I, glad I, that uh i'm glad that nothing will interrupt you as you try and deliver this lesson oh hold on a minute yeah i'm just joking i was oh, making an was interrupting that? joke Oh, wow. So remember when I said, don't screw it up? <laughs> yep. I guess you okay. didn't hear that. All right, sweethearts, let's get started. In 1981. Because when I say don't screw it up, I'm serious about that. <laughs> I want you okay. to just get right into it. Okay. I wonder if you're going to interrupt me today. In 1981. I would not do that. <laughs> In 1981. I want you to do hey, your how's thing. How's Sean doing? Did he fall asleep yet? No, he's In all right. In 1981. 
I did Porn an hour star. <laughs> Motherfucker. <laughs> In 1981, porn star John Holmes was John, charged Johnny with the Wonderland. Oh my Christ! Just do, just do the joke. Don't pay attention okay. to these Come idiots. on, man. Yeah, keep going. It, what are you stopping for? Night, Johnny Wad. What happened to him? In 1981, porn star John Holmes was charged with the Wonderland murders. You know, when we Please. interrupt you, you don't oh. have to go back to the very beginning. You can just pick up where you left off. Okay. Police always felt suspicious of Holmes. Considering was that in he was eighty one that that happened? I just want to be clear that know, this is the same. Know why this is the this. same Wonderland murders that we're thinking of. That was in eighty one, though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. In in nineteen eighty one, police always felt suspicious of Holmes. Considering any time he he was seen in public, he always had a private dick trailing close behind him. <laughs> <laughs> That was a long way to go for that one. His name was not oh, Scott Lewis, you. by the way. It was a different private uh, dick. Uh, that private dick had a long way to go, too. Wow. Uh, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> that was good. Next. Okay. In 1988, Gary Busey was involved in a horrific motorcycle crash. Apparently, he turned too hard around a corner and gauged the front brake, sending him flying across a street where he slammed his head against a curb. Doctors said the damage was so severe that Busey had to pay to repair the curb himself. Because <laughs> his head was very hard. The Gary Busey guy. <laughs> I love it when I stutter during a oh, punchline. It's, it's fantastic. It wasn't the stutter. Um, apparently, that was the same curb where Billy Idol hurt his head. Really? Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> number one. Just oh, okay. teasing ahead to room 7609 so people stick around. I don't know, you know what that is. Billy Idol right, was also and, uh, in a helmetless car or uh, motorcycle wreck. Oh, oh okay. That's neato. Um, is uh, Sean's muscle relaxers kicking in yet or what? They kicked in a while ago. He's got the mite all okay. going. All right. Well, this will wake him up. In 2018, a report published. The, the gimp is sleeping. Science. Wake him what? up. I said the gimp is sleep. When you said this will wake him up, I was thinking of the gimp from uh, from Pulp Fiction. But go ahead. Go ahead. Well, that's neat. You know, you can always send those to me in text messages. Hustle up, man. Come on. In 2018, a report published in Popular Science stated that that spending time in the Arctic had a tremendous impact on your health and longevity. The research was written by Starving Polar Bears. Because they they were trying to lure people out there so they could eat them. The, The polar bears. Where did the polar bears come up with that grant money? That's what I was it. Was it royalties from those Coke commercials? I mean, where did this <laughs> probably where did this come probably from? Probably whale blubber. Could be merchandise. Probably whale blubber. Oh, maybe Scrimshaw? They're selling Scrimshaw? Okay. All right. I'm starting my car and leaving. Okay. Or don't, my truck. Don't don't drive over the bridge. Wait, was that really the last one? Is that it? Yeah, man. Quickity. Well, you guys had like 17 guests today. <laughs> uh, apparently, we had one too many. Are Thank you, uh, Professor Jennings. That is uh, this week in soft history. Good job, Matt. I love you, my darlings. Thank you, Maddie. Good job, Matt. Breaking news with Mort Krim. Sean Mort has Krim. breaking news. Oh, sh- breaking. Krim. Yeah, he, he announces all breaking news. I love Mort Krim. Daryl Bevel hey, fired. Com- yeah, Daryl Bevel fired. <laughs> no, a couple of minutes ago, the University of Michigan announced. It canceled the Ohio State game. Really? The Ohio State I'm shocked. game. Well, actually, this I, Saturday was trending that way anyway, right? I don't think you can call it a game. Well, whatever it was, right? A scrimmage, uh, I guess. Uh, whatever you want to call it. Animal cruelty. Yeah, yeah it's this, gone. They're the ones who made Wolverines extinct. So you're not, you're, you're not surprised it was canceled? No. because Well, though, though I wasn't. This morning, they, Jim Harbaugh nobody normally speaks during the season on Mondays. They mm-hmm. canceled that yesterday. And then said he was going to talk today, but this morning they canceled that press conference. And but they had been practicing the last. Well, two no, yesterday they did, and then today they this morning they said they were going to just do light workouts with some group. So you kind of knew, right, that the cases were coming back. So in. the big question a lot of people have is: if there's only twelve cases, why is the game canceled when you see other schools even in twenty three? Big- Ohio State had twenty three guys who didn't play last week. Well, they had seventeen scholarship players, but it's a percentage, yeah, it's right? Still, they still got fifty two points. It's a percentage of the roster, and I think it's what six percent, seven percent, something like this. Real quickly, there's a quote sports from sports podcast. Yes, Ward. I was just going to say, who said that earlier in the show? Now he's giving us a sports update. Yeah, that was uh, 
Yes, that was our big idea. Big news, though. It's, it's huge news. It's not going to be big news by the time this posts. It'll be ancient news. Uh, we're still live on Facebook. Exactly. But thank you for keeping up, Mike. What, what's going on, guy who's always selling weight loss? What's going on, Tony Ortiz over there? Come on. Tony Ortiz. Yeah, you you're my, giving us an update. Do you hear my pipes? Come on, man. Let's go pipey. <laughs> Pipe down. Oh, is there more? No, that was it. I was going to read you a quote, but we don't need it. See you again. Matt. Look at the road, please. <laughs> Both hands on the wheel there. Come on, Matt. Shut your camera off, Matt. Focus on what's out there. It looks like he's riding that horse at Meyer. The one you put a penny into. Yeah, he does. Or maybe it's more like a unicorn. No one did they have it. unicorns too? <laughs> Little pink, purple polka dots. We interrupt this this brief interlude for Christmas cheer for a quote from Jim Harbaugh. He loves oh, the way no, you guys don't want to hear it. That don't was hear. Ward Manuel, by the way. Ward Manuel, like, okay. Yeah, great. Don't, don't read it. They don't want to hear it. The no, second don't. guy who should be fired in Ann Arbor. No, let's hear something else uh, we don't want to hear either. <laughs> Actually, I yeah. think you're going to want to hear this because it's good news. Rates are at all-time lows. Did you know well, that? Are they like at 1.9%? That is they're, great no, news. That's like, that's like super all-time Mid lows. twos? Mid, mid-high mid twos? High, 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 round two. Tell me more about it. Where can I take advantage of such a great piece of information? The bottom line is if your current mortgage is above 3%, you should not be waiting. You should be calling Hall Financial so you can save some money. And by the way, almost 70% of all loans do not require an appraisal. Now, you may remember in November that Hall Financial was going to pick up the tab for 500 bucks on your appraisals. They, at the insistence of Drew Lane... Are going to do it for December too, and I think hey. David Hall's kind of a generous dude. It is the season to be jolly and and big hearted and all of this stuff. So if for some reason your home does require an appraisal to qualify for a loan, they don't all require it, but if it does, Hall Financial is going to pick up five hundred simoleons of that appraisal price. Believe it or not, closing times have sped up again. Right now, the majority of loans at Hall Financial are closing in ten business days or less. So go to our website and click on the Hall Financial link to get started. If you give them a call, make sure you let them know ML sent you. Talk to my man, Dan Morrison. Hall Financial, lower payments, better options, more personal attention. And ML, S1467435. Yeah. Uh, they think, Dave Hunt Hall comes in and he kind of chills everybody out. He's a nice little, nice little. Sean and I were chill. Oh, yeah. wait, was that you guys? Okay, we so. usually are chill. Matt, quit looking at the camera. Uh-oh, he's, God. Yeah, there goes, uh, Keep your eyes on the road. So um, so we uh, asked we our, act like your dad. our listeners to uh, to give us some suggestions for new wave holiday tunes because we're all so sick of hearing the same ones we've heard over and over again. And this week, we are pleased to bring you the consummate new wave band, the Pet Shop Boys. With a forecast that might be accurate in Old Blighty, but isn't necessarily accurate over here. It's a little ditty they call, It Doesn't Often Snow at Christmas, Mate. I just threw in the last part there. Clearly. To see if Sean was listening. Cheerio! Christmas is not.
probably the most upbeat Christmas song I've ever heard. I love it's not the bad. Bands. No, a little pace bands. to it. So um, I know Mike doesn't like pace. A little pace to it. By the way, <laughs> have you ever tried stand up like this, LaDuff style? How does he do it? Is he like four foot? Uh, he has like a Mick little Jagger? more space over there, but yeah, I actually like standing up. Yeah, on the show. Especially you know you would have a sore back, you have bad knees, hips. Mm-hmm. Not so, you, me. I mean, no, I do too though. So. Yeah. Just right. just before we're going to get back into the rancor, I was going to say the Pet Shop Boys remind me that really. <laughs> All I do want for Christmas is to be with you. But now I don't give a shit. You guys can go, you know, go choke on a wishbone or something. It's What's on your Christmas. wrist, by the way? It's, this is my, this is my, um, is that your mask? My mask. That's what my daughter's taught me. You're supposed to put on your wrist. That way you don't ever lose it. That's what the cool kids are doing. That's nice. So, yeah. So there you go. The cool kids are my kids. But, uh, so that's pet. I mean, that was, that was, um, pet shop boys. Great, man. <laughs> that was a little synth. Got some bells at the end. I mean, why do we never hear this? We hear on it every commercial radio. Tuesday. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, but no, we, we, we hear the same songs over and over again. There's this vast trove of outstanding holiday music. Just mix one of these in. Just what you're please. really saying is fuck Bing Crosby and Nat King Cole. And no, I'm yeah. saying, well, I think I no, think David that. Bowie might have done Bing Crosby. Because they they had that yeah, duet. No, oh, I got it. I got, got was, the joke. As, I got as, it. We got it, Matt. As David Bowie said, he's bisexual. Thank so, you, Matt. So he said that in the Dick Cavett show, <laughs> but um, ahead of his time. But anyways, we we have more new wave holiday tunes coming uh, through December. Uh, I think next week we're going to have the waitresses. Is it hard to find them? No, no. Is actually, it, I was surprised because when we threw this out there and we asked the listeners to tell us whether they want us to get back to the new wave gems or try and do some holiday music. And people overwhelmingly said holiday music. I was thinking, Oh shit. It's like, it's like tossing a Sean and waiting for a, a cogent comment. You're like, boy, maybe this was a mistake, but I've already said it. So now we got to do it. And then and- when do you toss anything to anybody <laughs> well, ever? Sometimes I toss to you, but I'm some, usually alone. Sometimes you get tossed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Puffs with lotion. But um, yes. Uh, you make little noises, and that's all good. But when have you ever shared anything with anybody? <laughs> Sean, I, I'd like to make the next 30 seconds available for your exclusive use. I would just like, oh, I, I don't know what 26. to do with that. <laughs> do you know what to do with that, 21. Mark? Uh, Cyrus, take us out. 17. There we go. <laughs> 13. I'm sorry you didn't get to talk as much as you normally do. Nine. I'll say Four. Three. And Matt was right. We had like 15 guests on today. One. Here, do this. Wait, when you have your time, read that real quick. I thought I thought we wanted more people. Which one? Voices. Which one? Uh, the the one that how to donate donors call to action. Oh yeah. How to donate donors call to action? Yeah. Oh, I like the double backslashes here or forward slashes. Sorry, that's nice. This is ML's rundown that he provides that apparently Sean doesn't even look at. Yeah. That- <laughs> no, I look I look at it, but it's, these yeah, aren't stalling. sentences here. On Giving Tuesday and every day thereafter, no one gave. Mark- what? Yeah. No one donated? That's not true. Frank did. More lies from Sean. <laughs> Fake news. I'm calling the Texas Attorney General. Mark, remind us how to give. Well, it's. I think I know why he wasn't. We had a little bit of an issue. Our site was actually hacked with probably the dumbest hack in the history of uh, computer hacks, where it would change the landing of when you go to mlsoulofdetroit.com, there's a little donate button, and it takes us to the PayPal page. But for some reason, it wasn't doing that last week because it was hacked and there was a slight change in the address that it would take it to a random. And I, I came across about six different people that you could donate to them, which wow. was just a really dumb hack. doesn't take money out of our pocket. It would take money out of yours if you tried donating it to us and went elsewhere. Way to but, inspire confidence in but donors. It, but it should. it's fixed now. Oh, so it is fixed. Okay. When you click on that button. We're all uh, good to go. We are good to go. And Thanks to the Elrickian. Uh, well, I response. thought it was an interesting story. But, Explanation. But make, no, sure you see the lo- make sure you see the little logo on the PayPal. Can I read this, though, real quickly? Yes, I want you to do the rest well, of it. Well, let me just read this, though. Can you read it very quickly? Well, I, let me just read this. It says Sean Colon. Sean does absolutely no show prep and tries to play it off as nobility, or he names himself again. Now, am I right? Is that exactly what happened? I do, I do the prep every week. I just, I yeah, can't not preparation stand it. H. I hate that's the geek a, of the week. Entertainment. I'm just gonna let's just come clean. I hate the geek of the week. I don't like it. It goes against my my core. I, I refer. I would you, rather name myself. I or refer you, you to the tries Mark. to play it off as nobility. Phrase. It has nothing to do with nobility. <laughs> okay. it's, you're exactly right. It has everything to do with does absolutely no show prep. My grandma. What, what else is on the list? Oh, yeah. You print out the same thing every day and change a few backslashes <laughs> well, every week. Sorry. 
right, right here it says commit seppuku. It's a note to myself I just wrote in here. But, oh, here's uh, another one. How is Sean doing? Not good. Where is Sean going? Nowhere. How about that? <laughs> really? Does it say that? <laughs> yeah, you're all No, it doesn't say that. Oh, okay. It's just, it's just oh, it's such a, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Next time you want me to read something, write in sentences. I, I, you're so woke. I'm just afraid that you're never going to get any get any sleep. Woke. I'm because somebody I'm stepped hardly out ever termites. awake. What are you talking about? It's, it's a living nightmare. Um. Okay. It takes so me an what hour to get going here? in here. Oh my god! Listening well, you know, to you for sixty minutes. What's if, that? If you don't want to just donate, you can go to the Manscaped uh, page again. Oh yeah. For fifty dollars, if uh, yeah, shows your proof less. of purchase, not in photographic form. Only in uh, receipt form. We don't want to see any. Uh, yeah, yeah, no before and afters. Exactly. And then we'll do the little uh, Zoom with people. And uh, you can also support the show by buying stuff. Drew and Mike store.com, hoodies, long sleeves, tees. I think we're all wearing them today, too. Yeah, we got some sweet swag on. The beanies, they're all on the website. And of course, masks, gaiters, keychains. Oh, I've got the t shirt on, sorry. Stickers. And of course, these signed. Kwame Sutras. They cover my breasts a little. I, I like the sign Kwame Sutras because I think I get 100% of those sales. They lift them up, so to speak. It's actually, <laughs> this t-shirt doubles as a, a bro. It's, there's a, you know there's, what I mean? There's a so certain amount of spandex the in there. So my nipples but, actually point outward when I wear this t-shirt. <laughs> wow. Well, I, you just solved the problem of what am I going to eat after the show? The mention of Sean's nipples. What, you want some I'll, milk? I'll continue I mean, fasting. What, what is going on? Come on, man. Don't go there. This is a family actually, show. You know what I want? I want the milk of Detroit. That would be Altus lager the original detroit oh, lager that's making bad. a comeback not bad and the milk of human kindness if you don't mind well, uh, it is either. making a comeback that in the greatest city longer. in the world it's the do anything anytime with anyone beer maintaining a social distance you can also get it at the Cadu cafe by the way seriously i love to grab a case when i'm headed to hockey but even when i'm not While headed to driving. hockey because there's no Apparently. heading to hockey it's over forward. it's over so i always make sure i have some in my garage this is the perfect time by the way to have your yard beer in the garage because it's nice and cool out there another fun fact about altus is it only takes six of them to make anyone a 10 there's a lot of things that started here in detroit that went away but boy i am glad altus is back it's a lager that packs a punch and is seriously smooth and delicious go pick up some cans today for yourself and enjoy them don't know where to find them go to altus.beer and find the location nearest you i promise this beer is insanely good and you will be thanking me for the suggestion so i have a question for you oh yes if you say it takes six of them to make anyone a 10 does that mean you assume you are a 10 uh, i mean is that the implication well, that you're no, i'm 10, encouraging people that, to have six of them so i look better that you're a 10 and no, no. no i want everybody to have six of them so i look better okay that's that's all i was uh, just curious if you thought you were a 10 because i think you are no, he just nothing but the best for him he just okay. wants a 10 you yeah. guys have convinced me the show's going on too long uh we have some feedback dave writes hey ml try my best to spread some positivity so a few thank yous thank you for putting together such an entertaining show truthfully thank you for playing my eagles of death metal song a few weeks ago most importantly thank you for not having a selfish attitude when it comes to covid i think i let it get to me too much when i hear people some on a athletically themed podcast on this network never missing an opportunity to undermine the seriousness of the virus. Thank you, ML, and the rest of your team. Be good and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Mike nice. inquires, I was recently browsing John Fives, Marilyn Manson, Rob Zombie, Instagram. Local guy, yeah. And came across this old newspaper photo from 1983 by Mike Elric. <laughs> John Lowry is from Gross Point. I'm no investigative reporter, but the timeline and location seem to in indicate this was a little gem from ML's early journalistic career, if he did indeed take this picture. Love the show. By the way, I'm a huge New Wave fan and love Room 7609. A few months back when you were featuring New Wave covers, I was surprised you didn't include Morrissey's cover of That's Entertainment by The Jam. Maybe too obvious. Keep it up and be safe. So, uh, yes, indeed, that was my photo of John Lowry, who you know now as John Five. He was in a band with my brother called the Blizzard of Oz. And really? you would not believe it, uh, Manson fans. He was perhaps the preppiest kid in a very preppy high school. The pink polo shirt was uh, never very far from his back. But even when he was an itty-bitty 14-year-old freshman, this dude could shred this guy has been an outstanding guitar player probably from the time that uh that uh he could crawl 
Um, but yes, I shot that picture. And if you, if you see, we'll put, we'll put that picture up on our website. That's ML soul of Detroit.com. Uh, there's a, there's just a little bit of a picture bleeding over next to that, which is another picture I took of a guy named JT Harding, who was in a band called dirty tricks. That was uh, a local battle of the bands winner, got a little airtime on C jam, but that photo, um, was a national, uh, high school journalism contest hey. award winner. So, oh. uh, so the old man Whiskey's. had a few tricks before, uh, he got into the full-time writing biz, but yeah, John Lowry, super You're the nice old man? kid. Well, I am now. Okay. It's so. a third person reference. I know. Actually, I was you just know curious. what? <laughs> I want you to call me ML6. Why is now. your head cocked? ML6. Why is your like head ML6? cocked? Because I'm, 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 this is portentous. This yeah, is, this go. is important. Portentous or pretentious? <laughs> the, the, the line is so fine. I can't even Wait, see where they separate. You're, you're, uh, look, Mark, he's doing this. I know. I, 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 I Mark. saw him. Actually, call me ML4 and that will become clear in the new year. Just prefer to call oh. you handsome. More rhyming. Um, okay. Some handsome and kind. Any any more voicemails, Mark? Uh, there is Thoughtful. one. I, I, ah, really? I haven't screened it. Do you want to hear it? I don't know. I'm just so excited. We got a voicemail at two eight eight nine zero seven zero. Yeah, that's three one three Butterfield eight nine zero seven zero. We back it up. It sounds like he's leaving it for Sean. Oh yeah. Uh oh. Well, you mean uh oh? Maybe it's good. No, it's good. No, it's not going to be good. Hey Sean, thanks for uh, keeping the soul and the soul of Detroit. See? And uh, Mark, Uh-oh. love your. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, all right. But, uh, the one I was commenting on tonight is, uh, do not play Christmas tunes by any of the pop wave, whatever it is that you play here on the, uh, show. Just give us some old school, new wave, uh, things we never heard of before, even if we hate it. Thanks. That's good for you. I'll I like it. Even if we hate it. I like that. Sounds a little bit like Paul Egan, doesn't it? You think so? From the free press? Yeah. Just a little bit. Nice. Just a little bit. Yeah, tell the people who yeah, that is, please. He is he is one of the finest reporters in the state of Michigan and uh and the entire uh, nation of World. Canada. Yeah. yeah, he's a good reporter. Uh, Paul Egan, Detroit Free Press. You can see his stuff. Uh, and we do really want to encourage you to subscribe. It's like 99 cents a month for the first three months because of the business struggling and because of the way we've been hit by the pandemic, there will be people, or and because you want to be informed. Come on, right? Man. Well, yeah, but what I'm saying is why We're you should not support for it. Pity. But it's hard to be informed when we have to cut staff, and we will be reducing the staff at the Free Press in the next couple of weeks because we need more people to help support us. And one way to do that is to subscribe. So please go to Free.com and subscribe to the Free Press, or subscribe to the Detroit News. And that brings us to an email from Nancy who wonders. Among many things, why does the Detroit News exist? She sees there's more buyouts, and she's concerned that the Detroit News is uh, a shell of itself. Well, we we both Detroit dailies have lost staff, but the Detroit News still does some outstanding work. Uh, Nancy also wants us to uh, talk a little bit about MSU. Curious to get our thoughts on the new mandatory dorms for both the mm-hmm. first and second year students. Yeah, nice timing. Uh, I have no objection to that. I, I spent two years in the dorm, although the second year... It was because I missed out on an apartment with my buddies because I applied to be an RA and made it past the first round, but didn't get the job because I didn't think I would be doesn't strict it, enough. Doesn't it seem like a little bit of a cash grab to, I mean, it's not going to make up a lot of what has disappeared from COVID, but isn't, doesn't that seem like it's part of it? No, I don't understand that because I, I think- the, Do they have the space, Mike? The demand for, for uh, to, to go in the dorms is one reason why so many kids get put on the wait list because they have a limited number of beds and they have- exactly. A lot of people who want them. So but why are they making it mandatory then? If they don't have this beds. I don't know. That's even dumber. I don't know. And I thought I read somewhere that they said if they did this and they utilized all the campus housing that they could add thousands more students. None of it makes sense to me. But to me, I loved living in the dorm. And that's when the cafeteria sucked. I met a lot of friends who are still friends today. Had some great times. Of course, we could still get kegs in the dorms back then. But uh, we didn't have cable. So that would have been another thing that. So, so yeah, I don't have a problem with it, but, uh, I thought um, you were on the board of trustees up there. What do you mean? You no, don't no, know? I'm on the, I was on the alumni board of the Com- college of communication. Okay, I knew it was some board, but, um, oh. the, uh, Nancy yeah. says she would prefer her daughters to stay on campus. But when she was at state in the nineties, it was sort of dorky to stay as a second year student. So I, I hated living in the dorm. Hated it. 
Well, it's, it all depends. Not, not a fan of communal bathrooms in general. Oh, I love communal bathrooms. Or hearing all the noises, <laughs> why if you, you know love, what I mean. Why do you love communal bathrooms? You know, because at yeah, Michigan no- State, we had an amazing grounds crew, and they still do, because my daughter went there and loved the housekeepers. Those bathrooms are always clean, and I never had to clean it. Or having to go out into the hallway because your roommate wants to get busy. Yeah. Well, that's, you know. I know. If you're the one getting busy, it's not such a problem. Maybe well, That you wasn't me. I wasn't that, you know. We can't Appealing. All, I'm still not. We didn't, can't didn't all be have, MLs. Didn't they have a bike room or a quiet study room nearby? A bike room? Yeah, they put bikes in there and, and chicks. I would just go over to the library, you know. Hmm. So you're the guy not, we saw. Not study. You're the one not, they called the study. cops on. Okay. No, I'd just go over to the library <laughs> and just sit there and listen to Rodney Dangerfield tapes or something. So, so this show has gone on too long, but I, one quick word about oh, communal wow. bathrooms. I was living in a house. It's gone on too long for everybody but you is what you're saying. It was, it was li- I was just waiting for Sean to stop so I could get a word in edgewise. We, we were living in a house, and all the guys got mad that the other guys weren't doing their chores. At least you said we instead of I. Exactly. So um, so uh, the, <laughs> the deal was everybody was supposed to buy toilet paper. People stopped buying it. So we had no toilet paper. So then people started going at work. And one of our buddies, who was really the reason we had to do this because he would never buy toilet paper – got fired from his job. And after a couple of weeks, we're like, so we all take a shit at work. You don't have a job. What, what are you doing? And he said, I take a lot of showers. Oh, so he, tr- he treated it like a bidet. Yes. So oh, that's nice. We all thought we had won by shutting this guy down. And now we just found out we were standing in, in his, his toilet Ugh. every time we took a shower. So I love communal bathrooms. So you didn't think, uh, you oh, don't yeah, think cause- the water washes it away. Let's just, just, just say there's some particulate matter. And we're certain that uh, nobody does that kind of thing in a communal dorm bathroom. No, but they got scrubbed every day by housekeeping. Okay. And those that's the place where I learned you can put a shower curtain in the in the washing machine rather than throw it out. So That's what you that's learned? Good. Okay. No, it's good. It saves the earth. <laughs> that's a good thing to learn in college. A couple other notes Thank from God Nancy. For that uh, I'm going to call yeah. her nosy Nancy because she's curious about everything. Is Dan Gilbert actually building anything downtown at Hudson's three-year anniversary of the groundbreaking Great question. and nothing there? I don't know. That's a good question. And here's where I'm, where I'm, where I'm bringing this up. Downtown Ann Arbor has the same thing. Library lot, underground garage was built to withstand a tower on top. Ten years later, still no tower. What, is that true? What is that is about? true. Yeah. What's going on there? I'm not, I, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Well, it's, it was contentious. It's a nice lot. <laughs> it was contentious for a while too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Nancy, um, good questions. We'll try and get some answers, but we appreciate your feedback. We love to hear from you. Please send us emails at mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com. Send us your voicemails. We love to get those, 313-288-9070. Maybe we should screen them. But anyways, um, uh, just want to say a word for some places to support. You heard about restaurants and businesses. Go get a gift card. Try and help them out. Give yeah. them a little cash flow. And then when we get through all of this, not only can you go back and have fun like you used to, it'll feel like it's free. Mm-hmm. So come on. Do or it. some curbside pickup. Or carry out. Yeah, yeah, any of it. Which yeah, we did whatever. last night. Let, yeah. let's, let's keep them going. Um, Red Shovel Network. Plug. That's what it says here. I Something about sure. Charlie LaDuff. You hate him. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I love him. I just don't want to stand up. Is that okay? In his shadow? Is that what you meant? You didn't want to stand in his shadow? <laughs> we're, we're all in Charlie's shadow. Really? I thought it was just you. No, no, no. I'm in Mark's shadow, which I like to be. He's got those nice big calves, and they keep me warm. (laughs) I mean, you know, psychologically. I block a lot of light. Uh, Cyrus, cause amnesia for me. Um, That's the Charlotte Duff's No BS News Hour, No Filter Sports with Eli, Denny, and Bob, and, of course, the Drew and Mike podcast. And while I should have said this half an hour ago, it's still not too late to call upon our friend Cyrus to take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? You've just heard another adventure with... The Soul of Detroit. Starring... M.L. Alaric. The script was by Gene Levin and Bob Mitchell from a story by Richard Foster. Featured in the cast were... Sean Windsor. Ed Max, Jack Crucian, and Bud Woodham. Special music is by Richard Arant. The Soul of Detroit was produced and directed by... Mark Fellauer. Music and a lot of fine music is coming your way almost immediately on Red Shovel Network. Von Monroe will be around with his great band and the top hits of today. Gene Autry will come riding with more of the sagebrush songs for which he is famous. So stay tuned right now for Von Monroe following immediately on Red Shovel Network. Larry Thor speaking.